Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm Josh Williams and I'm joined by Mo Stewart. Mo, how was your week, mate? Been okay, actually, yeah, been okay. Like, starting to get a little bit of feeling back in my fingers and toes now. It's not quite so freezing all the time. So, yeah, looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to this show. I know I say that every week, but I think this one's going to be pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. <laughs> well, it's going to be interesting, I suppose, um, because we've got tactical changes to talk about, and we've got transfer news, I suppose, to touch on, things like that. So, But a lot of it stems from the, the Chelsea game, actually, um, some links around the Chelsea game and things. So we're going to pretty much revolve around that because we don't, Historically on this show, Mo, we don't overly like talking about domestic cups. <laughs> and uh, the fact that we've got Brighton this weekend is slightly worrying again, considering they've just hammered us. But rather than looking ahead to the Brighton game after just playing them, probably going to touch on Chelsea a little bit more. But um, what did you think of the game? Because I, I, I think this is interesting because specifically like around half time, I checked my phone. I had a look on mm. Twitter and... Everyone hated the game. <laughs> Everyone was convinced <laughs> that it was just another terrible Liverpool performance. And uh, I'm interested to know what you think. Well, I think part of that feeling, I don't know whether you were watching it inside or outside, but being on Weather Watch, it was bloody freezing. And it was a half 12 kickoff. <laughs> and there were lots of things that kind of made you think a little bit, Ugh. but okay, being serious for a second. Um, The game itself, when you're watching it, it felt like a bad game. It felt like a game where you were watching two teams who were clearly mid-table for a reason, who weren't able to click in the way that they were possible. And I think that probably led to the kind of emotional reaction of how bad Liverpool were, simply because Chelsea were worse than they'd been in a while and we should have been able to beat them and we weren't. But I watched the game back again a couple of days later and... I kind of understood certain bits a little bit more. There's still some parts of it that I don't understand and wouldn't have done if I was Jürgen. But I kind of see where he was going with what he was. When he said afterwards it was a small step forward, that's exactly what it was. It was a baby step forward. As in, we had probably four or five objectives in the game and we ticked off maybe two of them. But that's better than zero. And so I think... I said on one of the other shows, it was an admission of where we are in as much as how broken things are and how slowly things have to be rebuilt when they are that broken. But yeah, I think it's one of those results that we won't really know how good or bad it was for a few months yet. Yeah, well, I half time when I when I checked before on that. I was a little bit a little bit surprised by what I was reading because as I said, people were categorizing it as another terrible Liverpool performance, just grouping it with everything that we'd seen before. And I don't think it was good by by any means. But I definitely thought it was different. And the reason I thought it was different is because Klopp abandoned the high press. He, he he completely avoided uh, pressing in the final third when it comes to like Chelsea's goal kicks and you know Kepa was was free to play as with as much time as he wanted. Same with Thiago Silva and Liverpool kind of adopted like a, a mid block of sorts and um, the team did press, but it wasn't until they reached a certain point of the pitch before Gakpo. Yeah. Then started moving, and then everybody moved with Gakpo as like a United unit, really. Uh, and as a result of that, Liverpool didn't get opened up anywhere as much, anywhere near as much as they have done in the past couple of months. We didn't get sliced through, which could have certainly happened against this Chelsea team and against the Graham Potter side. Um, and we we did concede chances throughout the game, but a lot of them were set pieces and a lot of them were almost like unforced errors where we just made stupid decisions on the ball and I must say I don't think we were great on the ball throughout the game and that's probably why it was categorised as a bad Liverpool performance but I thought defensively it's the it's the most compact we've looked in a game 
for a while. And for me, that's very overdue and a, a very welcome change for me. I agree. And, and I think maybe it's because these are the things that you and I have particularly been focused on, partly through doing these shows and partly through, that's just how we watch the game anyway. But yeah, I took a lot of encouragement from that part. And it wasn't so much just the fact that we were compact. It was, you could see what the plan was. And you could see that the players felt comfortable with it. It wasn't perfect at all times. I do have to give some credit to Chelsea, in particular Kai Havertz, who whose brilliant movement allowed him to kind of find those little pockets of space on the edge of the area a couple of times. But in general, you could see what our plan was to stop and do that. I think the interesting thing as well is, like you say, it was a change considering what we are used to as a Liverpool team. But it is something we've done against Chelsea before. I kind of look back into it. We had a period in the second half of the FA Cup final where we did kind of do the same thing, where we just let, allowed them to bring the ball to a certain area before we pressed. I thought at the time it was more to do with kind of the difference in our energy at that point in the game. But it did a good job similarly of containing them. And I think in that we tried to do it in times in the 2-2 game at Chelsea as well. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't quite have the players. I believe that was one of the games Tyler Morton was playing, so it wasn't as effective. But it's something that Klopp has clearly seen as works against this Chelsea team. And maybe that in its mind, and maybe the fact that it has worked, was what helped some of the players kick into gear. Because in that FA Cup final in particular, <clears throat> Kite and Thiago, both started in that game. It's one of the few games they did actually start together. And it was almost as if Klopp remembers that and thinks that one of the things that those two can give is that compactness, but also a connection between the midfield and the defence. And I feel like in that respect, they did that job okay. I agree with you, though. I think a lot of what good we were doing offensively was let down by our inability to keep the ball. And... It's such a fundamental part of the game. It's so frustrating when it goes awry. And like I say, it's really so important to everything we do. But as I say, from the defensive standpoint, I agree. I do think it was a step forward. Well, you you just mentioned there that we've done this against Chelsea in the past. And I think that's the big question for me. That's what's really interesting, which purely to face Chelsea. Or was this more of a wholesale change that we're now going to keep in place for the rest of the season? I hope it is the latter, personally. Um, because Klopp's made a lot of tactical changes this season. He's used 4-3-3. He's used um, 4-4-2. He's used 4-3-1-2 diamond, which we saw again against Brighton. And it was a shambles with Thiago as a number 10. He's used Darwin on the, on the wing. Um, he's Gakpo through the centre now, Elliot's on the left now. So he's tried a lot of things, but one thing that's been consistent throughout the whole season has been the approach has always been the same in that the high press has always been present. Apart from, yeah. funnily enough, the game at Anfield against Manchester City. Yeah, and we won good. that game as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the idea that we've been a high pressing team all season, obviously we are that. But if you, if you look at the makeup of the team, specifically against Chelsea, the front six players are Mo Salah, who is now 30, is he 30 years old? Um, then you've got Cody Gakpo, who's kind of still learning the ropes at the club. He's only been at the club for a few weeks. Harvey Elliott, who's a kid, and a midfield three then of Navi Cater, who's picked up countless number of injuries over the years. Stefan Bessetic, who was still a teenager. And... And Thiago, who's there as you want, and has never been much of a runner anyway. So, if you think about it, you're asking them lads to press high up the pitch, cover all this ground and things like that. It's not suited to them. <laughs> it's no. just not. It might be when we've got Bellingham in the team. It might be when Nunes is playing every week, when Diaz is playing every week, Joss is back, things like that. But right now, it doesn't suit Liverpool's game. And I think the, the decision to go with this mid-block was a positive one, even though the performance was a little bit shaky on the ball. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see if it's if it's kept against Brighton this weekend. Well, I think you mentioned the Man City game. Apart from the fact that they're two big teams who Liverpool 
could quite easily lose against and have lost against in previous matches. They're two teams who you can expect to dominate possession. And Liverpool do normally dominate possession in all games they're into at the moment. But those are two teams you'd say would give them a, a fair run for their money in that. So maybe that was what for, came into the thinking in terms of the low block, as in <clears throat> allow them to have the possession they want, but not necessarily to make it as devastating and penetrating as they'd want. Whether that works against everyone, I don't know. I still think that Liverpool are going to need to find some better... Um, attacking processes if they are going to play that mid-block. Um, you mentioned the runners. I think it's it's telling that we really didn't try to get balls in over the top, even though, I mean, Mo Salah's still Mo Salah. And I believe Co I've seen Cody Gakpo run pretty fast as well. So we do have <laughs> the players to be able to play that game, but we didn't really attempt it at any point in the game, which I thought was also interesting. But in terms of maintaining this, I think it might be more to do with whether Klopp is going to maintain the messages that he's sending to the guys who aren't playing, and namely Fabinho and Henderson. Because we've spoken a lot about them over the course of the season and about them not being able to do the things that they were used to be able to do and how it was almost torturous watching them try. Now Klopp is taking them out of the fire line and he's doing something different. The question is, does he think that they can do this something different? Or does he just think that that's the best system with the players who he now believes and trusts? Well, you mentioned Fabinho there. I actually wouldn't be surprised at all if if you put Fabinho in that kind of system. He looks pretty good. And that's simply because in a mid-block, he would be surrounded by bodies yes. for the first time this season, really. Um, he'd actually have cover. He wouldn't be expected to cover wide open spaces on his own. And I think over time, that has become the case. And he's not that kind of player. He's not like a a holding midfielder in the mould of like Fernandinho, Thomas Partey, um, maybe even Henderson at his peak, Wilfred and Didi in terms of like being really mobile, essentially. Fabinho is not that. So you need to present Fabinho with small spaces to manage. And if you do, he'll win the ball for you a lot. Um, so I think if you actually put Fabinho in that system that we played against Chelsea with the mid-block, I think he probably looks pretty good. But it's interesting that Klopp went with the midfield that we saw against Wolves. We did speak about that last week as to whether we would do that. I thought it was a really brave move for him to do it. I had no real issues with him doing it, really, if I'm honest. I thought he played well as well. Um, but I think overall, on the defensive side, at least before we moved to problems in possession, I think on the defensive side, it was a very positive step forward. As you say, it was a baby step. And we don't even know yet whether this will remain the case moving forward <coughs> for upcoming games and things. But it was finally kind of an, a bit of an insight into Klopp maybe recognising that the hype, it's not, it's not the right season for the high press. Um, and yep. it's not so much a formational problem where you can change it with formations, which he's trying to do. It's more a a tactical approach problem where you just need to remain a bit more compact and stop asking the players to cover so much ground because it's not specifically working. But the, the Fabinho thing is interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. I mean, <clears throat> for me, in terms of kind of looking at positives, I was looking at what we were like when we lost the ball. And we always had either a player in position or players who were sprinting back to get into position and able to do so in time to intercept the ball. I mean, I kind of made a joke that uh, none of our corners turned into counterattacks. And that's something, that's a win. <laughs> but that was happening a lot. So technically, yes, it is a win. Um, I also agree with you on the Fabinho point. I do think giving him less space to manage, particularly at this stage in his career, can help. But you really, if you are going to play that mid-block, you are saying that you aren't going to have as much possession and you are saying that you are potentially allowing a team to get confident by building up the play, passing it around amongst themselves. But if you can maintain in, in position, maintain your discipline, and as I say, make sure that when those passes try to get to the penetrative stage, you can be a little bit more decisive about it, 
then it can work. Yeah, well, that, that brings us to Liverpool's possession game on the day. Uh, it wasn't great. <laughs> uh, we both didn't expect goals of 1.4, which is relatively low for Liverpool, even this season, really. And it's specifically low for Anfield as well. It's not the worst, but it's it's not great. Like, um, And if you look at the way, way in which we use the ball, and the way in which the attack and makeup worked, the balance of it, I think we really lacked balance. Um, obviously, Salah played in his custom any role, but Gakpo through the middle, and Harvey Elliott, who is left footed, playing on the left, and I think that side of the pitch specifically didn't work. And then we had Milner as the team's right back, and I think Milner generally played okay, but. His tendency to cross, <laughs> he hit far too many crosses. Yeah, I'm going to get it up now, actually. The man hit 11 crosses. The next best uh, for Liverpool, at least, was five. So, Milner was a really keen crosser on the day. And when you think about it, you've got Elliot in the box, Salah in the box, and Gakpo, who, OK, he's like 6'3", but we established when he first signed that he is not an aerial threat. So, why Milner kept putting these crosses in? I don't know. Um, and overall, in possession, we said last week, didn't we, that Liverpool seems to be sacrificing a bit of the attack to, to be better defensively. But even despite that, you can still use the ball a bit better. You can use the ball so much better. I mean, going on Milner and his crosses, even if you think Gakpo is quite tall, <clears throat> he's not taller than Benoit Badiashile, who's 6'5". And he's certainly not better in the air than Thiago Silva. So it did feel like a little bit of a fool's errand. But I think it was also indicative of the fact that in the in the positions that he was in, the positions he was crossing in, he wasn't able to feed the ball into Mo Salah because Chelsea was doing a good job of stopping balls into him. And so it was almost like he was out of options. It wasn't like he was doing it because he had some grand idea that no one else was on the wavelength of. He just didn't have anything else to do. And when you look at Ovi on the other side, there was a lot of that as well. I think we spoke on the last show about putting young players in the best positions for them to succeed. And I don't think having Harvey Elliott on the left, uh, in the fourth time in his entire career as a professional, that he started on the left forward. And when you consider how many times he started on the right, that's telling. <laughs> There's a reason why no one else has tried it. And you look at the game and you, you kind of isolate what he's doing. And just the instincts aren't there to to try and make runs beyond and to stretch the defence on that side. And I just think he's not as confident on the ball in that area and it's making a difference. So you look at things that he tries to do when he's on the pitch and he wants to be in and around other players, making short passes, making quick little through balls. And he doesn't have the pace to get down the outside and... If you're a right back or a right wing back and you're up against someone who doesn't have the pace to go down the outside, he's always looking to play the ball short on inside. Then you've got a much easier job. And I think we made it a bit too easy to defend against. Yeah, I, I think the balance of the attack was, was wrong. And I think that was the obvious change for me when, when it comes to fixing elements of the game. I think Liverpool around half-time, just needed to move Gakpo to the left, uh, Nunes through the middle, stop conceding daft chances from set pieces and stop losing the ball so cheaply. I think those simple messages would have improved Liverpool perform Liverpool's performance a lot. And to be fair, they, they did. You know, But one, one of the things I found curious, though, was when Nunes came on, he didn't just go straight through the middle. He played on the left and we, and we kept Gakpo through the middle and that brings us on to our next talking point which is Cody Gapo uh, we did say a few weeks ago that with this being a weekly podcast we are going to absolutely overthink this thing to the end of the day <laughs> <laughs> even though he's only played something like 315 minutes or something at his new club so it's way too early for definitive conclusions but after four appearances now um, it's probably fair to say he hasn't had the best start. Uh, what are your thoughts on him, Mo? 
I I agree with that, but I do feel sorry for him. I still do, I do still think that a lot of his problems are exacerbated, if not entirely caused by the malfunctions of the team. I think if you look at the fact, if you look at the the, the eye test of what he's doing on the game. And I think most people are going to zero in on his shooting because <clears throat> partly that was one of the big pluses that we were told when he came in about his accuracy and his shooting and his, and his ability of shooting, but also because they are the, the biggest moments. They are the moments they can potentially turn a game. And he's still snatching at the ball. The ones that he, the two that were um, good, you'd say good opportunities that he, he hit far over the bar. Those were the efforts of a man who hasn't scored a goal yet. And it's very, very clear, keenly aware of that. Some of the other shots you can kind of understand. I think three of them were blocked. Two of them were blocked immediately to the point where maybe he probably shouldn't have taken the shot in that instance. But over the course of his whole performance, I think it's interesting what you say about the fact that he remained in the centre rather than going to the left, because that says to me, the club had a specific job for him in the centre. Now, if you go back to the Wolves game when he played there, his job was to kind of sit on Ruben Neves and try to stop him dictating the play. So with this Chelsea team, that role would fall to Jorginho. Um, I'm not sure that that was really what he wasn't doing well enough to make it obvious. I do... I, I, I do sympathise with him because it's hard to know exactly how well he's playing to, without knowing what he's really being asked to do. And if you look again about putting players in the position to perform, he hasn't had a console, um, concerted run down the left-hand side as we'd have expected. And maybe we'd have, he'd have expected. Uh, we haven't used him on set pieces yet which again, I spoke about last week, that was one of his big um, pluses coming in. And we had a game where Trent Alexander-Arnold wasn't on the field for an hour. He still didn't take a set piece. So there are things that he needs to improve on, no doubt, but there are so many things that we can help him with that we aren't doing. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think if you, if you look at him so far, one of the things we touched on when we first spoke about him, I think, was that Although he's versatile, there's question marks surrounding his ability to play as a, a lone front man through the centre, especially. And I think we've seen that already. I don't think he's anywhere near as capable as someone like a Firmino when it comes to receiving the ball with pressure coming from behind him. Uh, despite him being a tall lad, he's not particularly physically imposing. You know, he's, he's got... Um, He's got very boyish arms. <laughs> um, he's not the most like. <laughs> he's not like uh, a, you know a, a, the kind of player who's, who's difficult to. Uh, do you see what I'm saying there? Am I being too hard? I do know what you mean. I mean, it's hilarious, but I do know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he needs to work on that element of his game. Essentially, um, mm. obviously, he's having to play through that that that, that position because we we're, we're lacking bodies. Essentially, um, I think he's a player for the left. Um, potentially the right, but um, and potentially the, as, as a ten, maybe. But I, I predominantly think he's a left-sided player. Mm. He did post seven shots against Chelsea, which is promising and which is good because in his debut against Wolves, he played eighty-three minutes and posted one shot. He played ninety minutes against Brighton and posted one shot. Mm. Then he posted three against Wolves uh, away, and then seven against Chelsea. So that's slightly promising and as you say we, we, we touched on his ball strike ability a few weeks ago he does have that element to his game but the opportunities he got to showcase that against Chelsea you know he just kind of blazed blazed his shots over the bar and did seem to rush his efforts and things like that so I don't think he looks great yet uh, but I do think you're right in that a lot of it stems from the dysfunctional team that he's taken part in. Mm. And if you think of another fellow who we're going to get to in a minute, in Mo Salah, he's another attacker who is apparently struggling a little bit. Um, and you could you could argue the only forward at Liverpool who's had kind of like a, a, a normal season 
is is Nunes in a way. Nunes has kept, it, it has retained his threat despite the struggles of the team. And I think a lot of that just stems from Nunes just being such a one man attack who just hoovers everything up himself. And you know he's he's nuts, isn't he? So I think Salah and 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 Gakpo and and most players really have reliance on what's going on around them to look good. And I think that potentially explains like why Chelsea attackers over the past couple of years have struggled. Man United attackers over the past few years have struggled. It's generally a team thing. Oh, I agree 100%. And I think it's no coincidence the fact if you look at Manchester United and Arsenal, uh, they're starting to get more production from their strikers and their forwards once they've sorted out the, th- the midfield behind them. Uh, and Arsenal and Manchester United have both got very good functioning midfields and suddenly all their strikers are scoring. It's not it's not rocket science. I think from Liverpool's perspective, particularly Nunes is a law unto himself and the effect that that has on opponents is going to cause enough chaos that it's going to kind of create its own chances. In the same way that um, we used to say the press was the playmaker, well, he's just a grenade. And that's also becoming a little bit of a playmaker because once the dust settles, we can maybe pick our way through the remains. But you think about what the disruption that he's had to his season, getting the rare card right at the beginning, and he's still been able to kind of come back. That's just almost through force of personality, force of will. Whereas for someone like Gakpo, it's a little bit more difficult. Salah is the interesting one for me because... Most of the conversation about him this season is about us not using him right, as in he's not close enough to goal. He's We're not allowing him to do things. But, I mean, he has to take some of his responsibility here. I mean, what is it? No shots on target in the last three games. Like, say what you will about where we're using him and everything. That's that's not Mo Salah. And then you've got the eye test. Look at the, the, the game against Chelsea as the uh, um, example, there was the, the chance that came to him, admittedly came to him at a difficult height, dropping over the shoulder of a, of a defender. It looks very similar to one I remember a few seasons ago against Newcastle, where he pulled it down out of the air, swiveled and half volleyed it into the top corner. This time he had an air shot. There was another opportunity where he was right on the edge of the right-hand side of the box. We've seen it so many times where he cuts inside and curls it. This one went into the away fans. And it's things like that, that when you're talking about Gakpo and Nunes, there are mitigating circumstances, yes. And there are so for Salah. But Salah, Salah. Like 12 months ago, Salah was untouchable, scorching the earth wherever he went. We can't not hold him to at least some of those standards or at least hold him to a higher standard than the rest of the forward line because he has shown it in this system with these players around him. So. I'm a little bit more concerned about that. But before we go into dive into the full style of this, I want to I want to address something which I've seen rising, which is starting to annoy me. And it's the idea that Salah has stopped playing because now he's got his big contract. What that is, <laughs> is it completely disregards the man that Mo Salah is. We've seen his determination, his spirit, his Never give up. Do we all remember those T-shirts? And he's proven it time and time again. Back in 2021, when all was lost, he put out that tweet, said, I will fire you guys back. And he did. He put the team on his back. And I think it was like a goal or assist in six of the last seven games as Liverpool got into the Champions League that season. He's come back from tough times again and again and proven it. People are looking at the Aubameyang situation at Arsenal, the Meza Ozil situation at Arsenal, and they're importing that narrative onto him, and it, and he doesn't deserve it. He should be playing better. There are reasons for it, him to get criticism, but he's not slacked off because of the money. Come on, people. No, I agree. I agree. I think we can. That's that's a really lazy shout. That one. Um, it's boring to to be honest. Not even worth talking about that one. Really, I think. In comparison to previous seasons, though, he is currently, I suppose, slightly below where you'd expect him to be in terms of his numbers. Um, usually with, with Salah, and still to an extent I do feel a bit like this, is uh, and I don't think it's ever necessary to be too worried about him because it's the bottom line is, as you just said there a few times, it, it's, it's Salah. So 
he's so proven over the years that if he does experience a bit of a cold streak or whatever that might be, mm-hmm. um, it's gen- it's generally a matter of time before he just starts returning again. And he, he, under the radar, his numbers are still usually good, even if he's not scoring and things like that. And I think even in a bad game, he's still a big threat for the opposition to worry about. Still really creative, still quick, poses a threat in behind, things like that. Um, but I do... I, I do think it's it's another I suppose another, another issue I think for Liverpool and one of the additional things as to why we're not picking up decent results is on top of the defensive issues and midfield departments and things like that the injuries and attack the team's best play best paid player arguably the most valuable player is just not really in particularly good form at the minute and no. if you look at the season as a whole I don't think he has been for for many months really. No, and I think part of the reason why I'm kind of a little bit harder on him than maybe some people think I should is that in this situation where we knew we were going to have to maybe deal with a bit of transitional time in the attack, we had guys who were coming in who were getting used to it. First, we had Nunes. Then there was this Luis Diaz injury to add to Jota injury. And with every one of those moves, you think, okay, well, we're going to need to rely on Mo Salah more now because that guy's not there or because of this or because of that. And traditionally, as I mentioned, those have been the times when Mo Salah has stepped up to the plate and this time he didn't. But I don't know, maybe I'm being harsh again in judging him by last season. But at this point in last season, I think he was on 15 and 10 goals and assists. And now he's on seven and four, which is less than half. And... Maybe if last season was a spectacular high, he's not going to reach that again. But to drop less than more than 50% in both categories is bad. And Andrew Beasley of this parish, the wonderful Andrew Beasley, has got a piece coming out <laughs> later today, which I had a sneaky peek at. And it's not just about necessarily the goals and the assists, it's some of the underlying numbers are changing as well. One of which was um, take ons inside the box. Something that if you go think back to last season, all of his fantastic goals involved in dribbling past two or three guys in the box. I think he completed 19 take-ons in the box in the first 13 games of last season. This season, we've got to 19 games. He's only taken on 14. And he's only been successful four times. Four times he's been able to successfully dribble past someone in the box. Now, the box isn't big. And when Mo Salah's got the ball in the box, he's normally got two or three guys in front of him. But that doesn't feel like a lot. And I don't know whether this is a chicken and egg situation because I do think that with the struggles with the other forward line that I mentioned, as an opponent, it makes it a lot easier to just say, we'll just throw three guys at Salah. Those guys can't work it out on their own. And maybe that's what's happening. I Maybe I need to look deeper into it and think that maybe teams are doing a better job of blocking him off and that's where the production's dropped. But I say again, this is Mo Salah here. He needs to be able to find a way. Yeah, I mean, generally over time, you, it, it is something that does happen with age when it comes to these tricky wide players. Dribbling is a natural thing that does tend to gradually decline. Uh, and I think one of the reasons Salah is going to suffer a bit less from that potentially is because he's, although he, he can dribble and he has always dribbled and he's always provided the threat in behind. I think Sella can provide just as much danger when he's receiving the ball to feet and when he's not um, dribbling past two men at a time and things like that. He's just as dangerous when he's just kind of like making really incisive passes and things like that and passes into the box and stuff. But he's just not really doing that much overall. Um, Mm. Like if you look at his numbers for the season, last season, if we go to shot creating actions, so a shot creating action, um, for a bit of context, is just kind of the two actions leading up to the shot. So it's either the guy who's taking the shot or the you know the, the, the assisting the shot or whatever. Last season he averaged four point six per ninety in the Premier League, and that placed him seventh in the division overall. Uh, this season he is twenty second in the division by 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 the same numbers 
Um, and for a bit of context, he is beneath Andreas Pereira, Ilkay Gundogan, Michael Lise, Carl Matoma, Stuart Armstrong, Morgan Gibbs White, William, Saeed Ben Rama. Now, it's worth noting that a few of these players will take set pieces, so they've probably got a bit of an edge on them there. But Salah was up at se- seventh last season. Um, mm. And it's interesting, though, actually talking about the whole team thing, that last season, again, by those same numbers, Trent was fourth in the whole league. This season, Trent is 23rd. So, wow. again, another really creative Liverpool player who we know is naturally a threat, and we, don't, we shouldn't really ever be that one worried about him for that reason but it is a collective drop um, and it's a shame but I don't know I don't know how much of this to put on wait six months and start judging then because it's going to be I think it could be a case of once Liverpool are good again <laughs> with the yeah. obvious holes plugged things will just receive a natural boost but it's I suppose those numbers do offer an insight into the the decline that we've suffered this team. It does. And I think when you look at the the actual game itself, because sometimes, like you say, you don't know how much of this is down to individual performance dropping and how much is it down to the malfunction of the system, which is not putting them in position. I think with Salah, part of the problem is, is that when you're watching games at the moment, a lot of the time the attack is falling down with him, whether it's he's not being able to find a teammate whether he's miscontrolled the ball, whether he's had a, a bad shot or whatever. It, at the moment, it's, he's not able to build pressure. It's The ball's getting to him and then it's attack over. That is something that he can individually help with. And maybe that's the start of a, of a rebuilding. But I do think long-term, you are right. It's one of those things where we shouldn't necessarily... I, I'm not certainly saying that most sellers finished or dusted or whatever the phrase you want to use for him is he's certainly still Mo Salah I think once we start to see the rest of the team around him we will probably start to see some pick up but when you think back to what all what we were saying last week about confidence and the the difference that confidence can make to a team I would dare say Liverpool as a team would be a lot more confident if they saw Mo Salah stick one in the top corner in the first 10 minutes against Brighton <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, we've just we we just spoke about uh, the midfield and how that needs to be or or might need to be renovated before the attack and play start to pick up and things like that. Um, and that brings us on to our final talking point, which again relates to the Chelsea game, I suppose. Uh, Mason Mount <laughs> has been linked with a transfer to Liverpool. He's got eighteen months left on his contract. I think he currently earns ninety two grand a week. And for a bit of perspective on that, I think Kalidu Kulabali at the same club earns about three sixty. So there's quite a gap there and Chelsea seem reluctant to um extend or pay him what he deserves or whatever. And in six months' time he'll have twelve months left on his deal. So potentially there's like an Oxley Chamberlain deal in there where Liverpool can go to a supposed rival, but because the player's going to leave for free, Liverpool can buy him, or potentially Liverpool can get him for free in 18 months, whatever it might be. Mm. But he does seem to be links there anyway. And this is a controversial one, I'd say, because people seem to have really contrasting opinions on him. Um, we did, I did put this in the Analyzing Anfield production group before we uh, started recording. <laughs> and... Uh, Let's just say the the initial response from the producers is not favourable in terms of their opinion on him. Mo, I haven't asked you what yours is. You don't know what mine is either. What are your thoughts on Mason Mount? Um, well, I can understand to a certain extent why our producers, even though we aren't going to name and shame them, um, felt that way. Uh, I was surprised because, put it this way, I think he's a player who has looked very good and does some very good things. I think there's probably a question mark around his consistency at this point in time. But when we think back to what normally we think about about Liverpool players, do you see what he brings to a team working in a Liverpool team? I think I do. 
Does he look like the kind of player that Jurgen Klopp would go after? Yes, he does. Do I think that he could improve in a Liverpool team? Yes, I do. Do I think that there are other players who could do a better job? Probably yes. But we have to think about the homegrown element, which I'm sure comes into play. For me, the interesting thing about it is when you think about Liverpool past, particularly under Klopp, he does feel a little bit like he could be an Adam Lallana. Like, you can see how Klopp can look at him. He's very good on the half turn, very good in half spaces, linking up the midfield and the attack, but also leading the press out of possession. And these are all things that a Liverpool midfield needs and currently doesn't have. So, from that perspective, I can see, I can see the merit in it. The numbers, both wages and transfer fee, I think will be critical in whether or not I think this is a good idea or not. But there's a player there. There's definitely a player there. Yeah, for me, uh, I actually really like him. <laughs> be a bit of a surprising one for people to hear. But I'm a, I'm a big fan of him. I think he's really good. And I, I think Liverpool should snap Chelsea's hand off if they're willing to let him go. Stupid enough to let him go. Um, I think he's... I think he's a he's a really intelligent player. He's a natural presser of the ball, which is what we've been lacking this season. I think he's he's not, like Lallana in that sense, naturally inclined to close down and put a foot in in the final third. But despite that, as you say, he's really good in tight spaces. Um, he's kind of like a the the term I use for it is like a, a needle player in terms of just picking up the ball in the smallest spaces, keeping the ball in those spaces, um, kind of number 10-ish kind of thing. Mm. And obviously he's very tactically versatile and things like that. And like a goal from midfield. He's homegrown. He very rarely injured. If you look at his numbers over the past couple of seasons, last season he featured in 32 out of 38. Season before, 36 out of 38. Season before that, thirty-seven out of thirty-eight. So he, you know, he's available a lot. Um, I think it's telling as well that every manager he's had, yes, whether it be Southgate or Tuchel or Lampard or Potter, now they all just play him every single week, you know, and that's despite the talent that they've got. So overall, I am a a big fan of Mason Mount. I think he's a good player, mm. and I think he's. I think he'd be a positive, but I think the biggest um, the biggest question mark surrounding him, and I think where the criticism stems from, is I don't think anyone knows what he is in terms of a position and a role. Mm. Um, do you understand what I mean there? Yeah, no, I do. I think... You see a lot of players who are flexible and it means that they are always playing, but it does mean that they are, the team isn't playing to their strengths. They're, they're getting in where they can fit in, basically. And he's very much one of those because, as we've talked about, his qualities does lend him to be potentially effective in lots of different areas. But I do think that that can sometimes be a problem as well because... You say he can play wide on the le- as a wide forward, wide, f- um, but it's not the best use of him. And yeah, I agree. You, you find he he's certainly if he's again he's not someone who's going to burn a fullback on the outside for pace and then whip in a devilish ball. Um, in fact, if you listen to Chelsea fans, I think the accuracy of his crossing has actually been one of the things they're quite upset with. So. He can maybe fool you into thinking that he can do those, these positions when really he shouldn't. And I find that's an issue with some versatile players and some managers who like versatile players, including our own. But at the same time, I think my biggest potential issue with Liverpool bringing him in is if you listen to what Chelsea fans are saying now, you watch some of the games and the performances he's been putting in recently, he looks like he's suffering from the same physical and mental fatigue that all of our guys are. And when you look at it, you mentioned that he's been an ever-present for Chelsea. Chelsea have played loads of games. Like, we talk about our 63-game season last season. They had the same. Because the three games that we didn't play in the in the um, Champions League, 
that they didn't play in the Champions League semi-finals and final. They had the Club World Cup where they had two games. So I think they played one less than us. Season before, they, they had another really long season. I think it's 120 games they've played over two years. He's played in nearly all of those games. So there's lots of people within the Chelsea sphere who think he needs a break. He needs a rest out of the team, a mental reset. I think that's true. It could be that that mental reset comes from a change of scenery. Because yeah. to be honest, it sounds like a lot of the same things that Arsenal fans were saying around Oxlade Chamberlain, aside from obviously the fitness element, just that he needs a bit of a mental break. He, it's just when you get a player who's come through a club and clearly cares a lot about the club, if that club is going through tough times or that player is going through tough times, they feel it more. And some players have a personality where they can shake that off. Others, they internalise it and it causes them issues. I don't know whether that's happening now. I do suspect that happened with Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain. But when he came to a new place, he was able to have a new reset mentally and attack the new team. I think Mason Mount has that ability. I, I do wonder what the numbers are going to be. And I do wonder whether or not this is a case of Chelsea eventually relenting and just paying him what he's worth. Because... Again, if I was Chelsea, that's exactly what I would be doing. Yeah, it's in the system one in terms of numbers. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if we were to make a bid for him this summer, I'm not sure what it'd be. 50, potentially, I've got no clue. Um, but in, I think the, the stuff on his position is interesting, though, because, as I said, I think that's where most of the uh, controversy in terms of split opinions comes from. Because, he, for me, he's... Th- the absolute stereotypical type of player who, okay, because he, he's, he's versatile and things like that. If you play him as a forward, there's an expectation on his shoulders to deliver goals and assists every other week. That's what a forward is responsible for, essentially. If your designated position is in the final third, you have to deliver and you have to have end product and you have to have output attached to your game. And Liverpool have been an expert at picking up those players over the years. Players who can play terribly and still score four. <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. in Salah and Mane and Nunes now and Jota, they just, they're just obsessed with delivering. They just, they just naturally do it. Mason Mount, if you put him in one of them roles, and I think he's played as a forward far too much for Chelsea, he will look like he's not delivering enough. Mm. And last season, for example, in the Premier League, he scored 10 non-penalty goals and registered 10 assists. Right. Now, if you play him as a number eight and he posts those numbers, that's brilliant. And that's exactly what you want. And you've got that kind of offensive contributor in midfield that everyone loves and the Premier League has historically loved, like a Lampard or a Gerrard or whatever. Mm-hmm. If he's doing that as a forward for a team hoping to win the league, it's probably not enough. And you probably want more from him. So I think the, the expectations around his performances yep. are massively determined by where he plays and... I think I would do what Klopp did with Lana and what Klopp did with Chamberlain and what Pep has done with Bernardo Silva and just simply drop him further back in the system and play him as probably an eighth if most. And if you play him as an eighth, you get all of the nice technical stuff, the progressive stuff, good and tight spaces, pressing, and you will then get the odd contribution like a goal or an assist and it'll be... um a nice addition, really. Whereas yeah. if you put him in the front line, he probably just he probably won't score enough for you to ignore for you to appreciate the pressing side of the game and the possession stuff and, and things like that. Agreed. Um I would be playing him very much as an eight in a midfield three. I think part of the reason he doesn't yeah. he's played in the forward line for Chelsea is because Chelsea very often play with a midfield two. And I don't think he would suit that. I wouldn't put him in a double pivot. But I think the other thing about having him in the forward line is you're losing out on some of his best qualities, which is carrying the ball. He's not necessarily a a quick, uh, tricky winger, as I mentioned, but he can carry the ball really well. And his eye for a through ball, which is something, if you're playing in the forward line, you're less likely to play through balls because you're the one who's receiving them rather than playing them. So you give him a chance to arrive late 
to see the game in front of him and to work out what the best options are. Uh, I think that's his best game. Again, I think there are all things that he can develop. He's still, for all that he's played, he's still only 24. He's still a young player. I yeah. think if you have him in a side alongside uh, a truly energetic, destructive midfield six and another guy who can maybe control the tempo of the play, a Thiago perhaps, if you have the him on the other side of a, of a midfield three, I think he could be devastating. Yeah. If you think of like what he is profile wise, um, I'm going to, again, similar to last week, throw in a massive caveat here <laughs> <laughs> because this is not me saying he's going to be as good. This is not me saying he is as good or anything like that. But I don't think stylistically he's that different to Gavi at Barcelona in terms of being an absolute dog without the ball, but with the ball. Really cute, technical, good and tight spaces, great receiver of the ball, things like that. Um, and Liverpool seem really interested in those kinds of players, those players mm. who are just horrible without the ball, defensively really active, but then with the ball can be as delicate as in. Um, and a few players come to mind with that sort of thing. You know, you've got like a an Odegaard, potentially, mm. um, at Arsenal. You've got Bernardo at Manchester City, um, potentially someone like a Zelensky. Liverpool have been linked with for a few years, yeah. um, and we've got an emerging talent who looks roughly in that mould in Harvey Elliott. But I think Elliott is still only a teenager, amongst twenty four now, played in Champions League finals and World Cups and things. He's a lot more mature, and on top of that, I think Mount is a much quicker accelerator, and that helps a lot when it comes to high pressing. If you can just get to your man quicker, I think Elliot is a bit one, one paced from start to finish, really. Um, but yeah, he's he's not Gavi, but he, no. <laughs> I think he has a comparable skill set. Um, just not as good, not as special, but still roughly in that type of mold and offers those comparable skills. Mm. Um, I, I I think he's got a great attitude as well. I do honestly think. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. He's someone who's never hidden on the pitch and he has taken criticism from Chelsea fans and England fans as well. And he's had, obviously, everyone has bad performances. That's just what playing football is like. But he's always been, he's always come back from them. I feel like he's never dropped his, I've never seen him drop his head in a game, mm. uh, whether physically or mentally. I think that's important. And we need to think about these elements when we're thinking about the next evolution of the team because we've kind of taken the sum of them for granted that kind of extra layer of mental toughness that helps you in the tough times maybe we've kind of wrung it all out of our main squad so we need to replenish it so a few more players who've got that dog in them would not go amiss yeah i think he'd also open up potentially the prospect of four two three one as well um Obviously, we've spoken about that a lot over the years. Every time we tip it as a potential thing, it never happens. <laughs> but if we get Bellingham in, Bellingham can play as like the ultimate double six who can also do everything else as well. And I think if you if you were to play Mount as a ten, he could kind of be like a bit of a throwback towards like uh, like Mario Götze at, at um, Borussia Dortmund on the clock. It depicts shades of that for me. Um, but I don't know, we'll see. Just very, it feels like a long shot, just considering Chelsea would just have to be stupid, I think, to, to let him go. But uh, it's, it's they're gonna have to do, they're gonna have to do some moves which are probably gonna look stupid at the time because the fact is, is they've kind of spent their way into a corner that they've got too many players and they are gonna have to start selling. Well, them. If you think about it, imagine you are Mason Mount, right. And you're you're an academy graduate. You're playing every single week for Chelsea. Yes, you're watching them behave like this in the market, throwing money all kinds of different places. And they won't even give you a little extension when you're one of the key players. You know, you'd feel really underappreciated. So I do think for that reason it is possible. And um, yeah, I think it's it's a plausible one, but it's just a, a bit of a long shot as well at the same time. Yeah, and and also 
I do think it will be one of those things where if, if we get if we don't have Naby Keita anymore and he comes in, he will just take his role as the most divisive midfielder that we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> Henderson's on his way out as well, so Liverpool need yeah. one of those players, don't we? Um, but yeah, we'll leave it there, mate. So thanks for joining us, Mo. No worries, man. I enjoyed it as always. Yeah, and thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next week.